Today we're having Nancy Dickerson, a dear friend of mine, discuss a marvelous model that I think all teachers would find valuable. And she has a knack of being able to explain things so clearly and enthusiastically, and I'm sure in a way that we can all relate to. Without further ado, my good friend Nancy Dickerson. Hello again. Um, I have been a crisis counselor for 15 years at a center for emotionally disturbed children. And this is a model that we have gotten extensive training in and, have, uh, and has been a very useful model to train staff. And I, I would like to give credit to the people who have come in and done our training. This, is, uh, this Circle of Courage model is from the Reclaiming Youth Network, which you can find on the internet under Reclaiming Youth. Reclaiming Youth Network, Reclaiming Youth International. This is their original book, Reclaiming Youth at Risk, uh, and wonderful resources, people who could come, come and train. And we are working today with this beautiful picture here, the Circle of Courage model. I'm not going to do it justice on the board. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of this and go on to uh, talk about um, what happens with children who do not meet this model. Okay? This is called this... Uh, the picture here is called The Circle of Courage, put out by Reclaiming Youth Network. And this picture is a representation of a Native American symbol, a medicine wheel. And um, what the Native Americans believed was that there were four basic needs for children. And they are around this wheel. I'm going to put them up here and just describe the Circle of Courage. And uh, we start with the need for belonging. Children feel the need to belong in a home that is safe and secure and, um, and where they are feeling loved and there are people that they can trust. I'm going to very quickly go around to the next need which is called mastery. When children are in a safe, loving environment, they tend to learn from the caregivers that they, that they are with and they learn skills right up, right from the very start. They learn discipline, they learn uh, skills of tying shoes and, and eating and dressing and all the way up to readiness for school skills. Uh, if that all works well, we go on to independence. The need for independence is very strong in children. I always think about the children who once have learned to master tying their shoes. They wouldn't possibly tolerate anybody tying their shoes for them after that. I know how to do it myself. And when children come into kindergarten, they're so wonderful. They're trying to figure out how to be independent in their skills. The next one goes around to the final need, which is generosity. And um, when children become independent, what happens is that they're often way willing to say, hey, I can help you with that. Let me show you how to do that. And we see this, and when it's intact, children are wonderful about this circle. They feel like they belong, they master skills, they become independent, they be, they're generous uh, to their, their peers and their teachers. And what happens is that their generosity turns around and contributes to their belonging in a beautiful circle. And this is, this is wonderful when it happens. Now what I'm going to do is modify this slightly and, and show you what I see with children who are having difficulties in crisis in schools. Children in need end up not feeling any of these needs being met in, in ways that are helpful to them. So I'm going to revise this and we're going to call this the flip side, the circle of fear where a lot of children are coming from when they come into school. And instead of feeling belonging, they experience the opposite of that, which is rejection. Rejection can come in the form of rejection at home by caregivers in the form of verbal abuse, physical abuse. Um, rejection can also come in the form of children coming to school and getting rejected by their peers or having some sort of a learning disability and showing up in school and being rejected from a reading group, uh, re rejected for a number of reasons due to physical abilities, not being picked for teens in schools. There's lots of places where children can feel rejection either at home or in school. Well, 
When you come down to mastery then, a lot of children experience, instead of mastery, they experience failure. And when children have a problem being successful and feeling failure, they tend to also feel the rejection again. So, so these two, in, in a lot of ways, go hand in hand. You'll see children also trying to get back to belonging and constantly failing. With, with children who are in school and they, they bring in treats or try and bring in money to kind of buy friends and children will go, I don't want your money or I don't want your food, another form of rejection and failure for kids. Okay, around here, if you've got children who experience failure and rejection, when they become independent, where they would become independent, often they become very either dependent or isolated. Um, I, I see both of these things happening with children who have gone through these two things. Sometimes children are very whiny and say they can't do it themselves and they kind of cling to the teachers or find a friend who does things for them. I knew a, a child who was always with another child and I couldn't figure out that he was quite an older high school student. Turned out he couldn't read a clock. And he relied on that other student to tell him when it, when he, what time it was in terms of uh, when classes changed and what he, where he had to go. Um, very dependent on other people for just basic needs. Other students will become very isolated at this point. And I always use the example of a fourth grade student, there's always one in every class, who sits down in the back of the, of the uh, classroom with either a hood or a hat over their head, and you may not see that child's face for the entire year. This is a child who has experienced failure and rejection, has decided to isolate himself or herself to the point where um, they, they are not going to risk being rejected again. And a lot of times what happens with children like this is that people just leave them alone and they just sit right in that isolation for quite a long time without being helped. Instead of generosity then, for a child who has experienced rejection, failure, and isolation from their peers, what happens is that instead of pro-social generosity, we see antisocial behavior. And so what often happens is that we see only this behavior. We meet up with a child on the street, he throws garbage at our feet and refuses to pick it up or in the cafeteria or someplace like that, antisocial behavior. Spits near us on the sidewalk, antisocial behavior. Snarls, sneers, yeah, <laughs> Bill's making some antisocial gestures back there. Yeah, we see a lot of it and it is designed to keep from being rejected again. And, and uh, if you can understand that this antisocial behavior just again you know, brings us back to more rejection, it's another perfect circle to keep these kids on the flip side of the circle of courage. And the only way to get them to go back over to the other side is to just work on helping them feel like they belong and nurture and nurture and nurture. Um, I have many suggestions about that. I'm not sure how much time we have left. What, okay. Um, one of the things there, uh, Richard Kerwin put out a model of, I think that was called the five minute intervention. And with children, especially uh, surly teenagers, I always call this the five second intervention. When you're walking by a student who's got that surly look and the head down, what I often say is, hi, I like the color of your shirt. And I'm gone before they can say, Boop. <laughs> to me. <laughs> and I continue to try and kind of woo them and let them in over time to the point where they can't ignore me anymore, or just a hand on the shoulder or something that will get their attention and let them know that I'm here and that they, they're okay. And if I am allowed a conversation and get in a little bit more involved with it, that student, I let them know how much they're liked and, and we're glad that they're here. Welcoming a child on any given day. Here's an example of a student who faces rejection at school. And, and I don't think that the staff member understands it as rejection, but this is how it's taken by the student. I've had a lot of students who come into crisis and they're throwing chairs and tables and they end up being restrained on the floor, a terrible ordeal. And when I finally get them calmed down and we're in a room sitting together and I say, what went wrong today? I, I, I can remember a, a couple of students being very clear 
about the fact that they had been out of school for a couple of days, something had happened at home, they were sick, or some family member had had a crisis. They came back into school already feeling bad, and the teacher said, nice, nice to see you, where were you? Instead of, I'm happy to see you, I'm so glad you're here, are you okay? Very, very different effect that you have with students. So, this is called the circle of fear. It is uh, just in response to my use of the circle of courage from Reclaiming Youth Network. I hope you find it helpful. Um, there's a lot more we could say about this, but it's a nice framework for thinking about children, especially teenagers, who are ha struggling in school. Thanks. Nancy, what I love about your presentations is it gives us so much to think about and to discuss. And I think all of us can imagine examples for every instance on the circle that you uh, describe. And what you emphasize is that it can happen unwittingly where we're participants without realizing it. Well, once again, Nancy Dickerson, I want to thank you so much. Thank you, Bill.